<sighs> okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening, or good afternoon, or good morning, depending on when you're listening to this. Welcome to the 66th of hopefully many episodes of Bard Advice, a D&D slash TTRPG slash nerd podcast where I, Charles Chaz Yazik, the DM, the Bard, however you may know me, do my best to answer any questions that you might have regarding any of those things. I hope that everybody is doing well. Happy to see all of the regulars in chat. Thank you for being here. As you know, you make this show just as much as I do, so your uh, your participation is much appreciated. At the top of the show, as we like to do, remind everybody of the email for the show, which is bardadvice at gmail.com. It also looks like bardadvice, if that helps you remember. If you'd like to get some merchandise, you can do so over at manshorts.com, or more importantly, over at krakendice.com. You can get the new Sarah dice or the Man Shorts Part Do dice, and I believe that, um, I'm not sure if it's this Thursday or the next one that the new ones are coming. Follow on social media and stuff to see that, but I, I, think, it's the, I think the next set's coming this Thursday. Also, if you'd like to contribute to anything that I'm doing musically, you can do so directly via PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo, all of which are Yazik, Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. Happy to see everybody and hope that everybody's had a good week. Something else, too, before we really get into things is I'd like to remind everybody of our sponsor this week, which is World Anvil. If you don't already know, World Anvil is an online set of world-building tools for writers and game masters. It allows you to create wiki-like articles that can be cross-referenced. You can make interactive maps, historical timelines, family bloodlines. It's a great organizational tool for D&D or any other similar TTRPGs, and its organizational capability is so advanced that it doubles as a novel writing software. So I, the, the biggest reason that I wanted to mention this World Anvil is that the discount with, use, with using the code promo Manshorts, excuse me, with using the promo code Manshorts is actually 51%. I'd noted before that it was 40, but it's actually 51%. So if you want 51% off any of the annual memberships over at World Anvil, just head over there and use the promo code Manshorts and you can get that. All right, so we've got some stuff to get into this evening. We've got uh, several questions. Oh, also, uh, wait a minute. Don't let me get too far because there's other things too. River just posted a Discord link in the chat, so anybody that wants to join the Discord, please do so via there. Um, Reminder, uh, remind everybody that we're very thankful for our members, our patrons, our super chatters, and remind everybody to please like, comment, subscribe, turn on your notifications, and rate the podcast on your respective platforms. One final note before we do get into anything is that I wanted to publicly express apologies to Kate Middleton and her family. When we made the conspiracy video a couple of weeks ago, this was obviously before the news about her cancer diagnosis has come out. You know, it would never be my goal to poke fun at a situation like that. I'm sure it's very difficult for her, and I'm very sorry that she had to go through that in terms of the news coming out that way. You know, she should have the autonomy to let people know that when she's ready. You know, the joke was really supposed to be about the idiots that are making all the the assumptions and the conspiracy theories, so... Um, apologies to that. I got more than one email about that. So it was a thing where I, I probably could have made an adjustment to it or maybe even pulled it entirely, but I decided not to. So, you know, it's not the proudest thing. Although, you know, the biggest thing for me is like intention. And I hope that everybody knows that, you know, that's not a thing that I would ever make fun of. And, you know, it, it was just a situation where we had already filmed it. Everything was ready to go. And I made the call to post it. So it's been a learning experience for me. And I think that's all. That's all about that. So, okay, let's get into it. So we've got six questions and a follow-up tonight. And one of the questions is uh, that I'm saving until last is actually pretty heavy. <laughs> so uh, we're going to kind of, I'm going to kind of use that question to sort of merge into chat chat. So hopefully we'll be able to get some of that done this evening as well. So Art Corner. We've got some art corner this week, and there's two things that I have that I'd like to speak about with art corner. The first one is this thing that I really only recently discovered, and (laughs) it's this guy that I follow on TikTok, and the name of the show is Dracula's Kung Fu Theater. It's got kind of like an MST3K type vibe to it, where he just kind of, he watches old kung fu movies, but the great thing about this guy is that he's always in character. 
So, and you could follow him on TikTok. I think he's super underrated and under like a underfollowed. I'm I'm amazed that he doesn't have more followers because it's just really funny if you check him out on TikTok. But then he also has a show that his show that he does on Retro TV. So, Dracula's Kung Fu Theater is definitely worth checking out. It's definitely in that vein of like fantasy humor, and the dude really commits to the bit. It's really great. And just another note that a show that my wife and I have been watching on Hulu is The Regime with Kate Blanchett. That's been pretty funny. I think mostly just because it kind of shows the <laughs> just the, the 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 human nature and the stupidity and the, the the weirdness that comes with royalty and power. And I think she's been really funny. I've only seen uh, the first two episodes, and so I'd like to watch more of it. But that's a good one that we've been watching that I would recommend for anybody to check out. Okay, so that is... So uh, w the regime is about... Um, Kate Blanchett is a ruler of, I think, a fictitional... A fictitious... Is fictitional a word? Fictitious country in Europe. And she's kind of like the super dictator, I guess. And so it's just funny because you get to see the the way that she behaves and the kind of stuff that happens around her. Like she's she's kind of like neurotic. She's got stuff going on where she like wants to have like she she wants to measure the moisture in all the rooms and stuff because she's being convinced that she's uh she's sick or something. It's interesting. It's one of those things I think too that you kind of have to watch to really understand. Um and I wanted to talk, too, about some of that stuff with... Maybe we'll talk about it in chat chat. Somebody remind me in chat chat to talk about, like, my thoughts with AI and writing. Because I think that that's... I think we're already starting to see that. So. And, yes, thank you for the reminder. Everybody in here, please like the video. If you're in here, give it a like. It helps the algorithm. Make sure to comment, subscribe, share, rate the podcast, all those things. So. All right, let's get moving. We've got six questions and a follow-up. So the first question this evening is actually from River. Was going to start with his, and let's get into it. So River asks, what is your ideal party makeup for four players? Wow, thank you for the question, River. Um, I think that I've talked about this at some point in some form or another before, but... It was a fun exercise to do again because I was just thinking about, like, I guess if I was limited to, and you kind of are in things like Baldur's Gate 3, if you were limited to a four-player party, what would your ideal party be? So, going to need a strength. Um, we're going to need somebody that's strength con, somebody that can tank, somebody that can take hits, and then more importantly, somebody that can break down the door if we need be. So, I think either fighter or barbarian has to have one of those spots. Personally, I think fighters have more overall utility. So, especially like depending on the addition, I think you can do way more with a fight. Well, I don't know. I was going to say 3 5, but you could do a bunch of stuff with all kinds of stuff in 3 5. But it just, in my opinion, I think fighters have a slightly more utility. So, I'd probably go with a fighter to fill that spot. Somebody that can kind of tank and be the strength character. You're going to need dexterity for stuff like stealth, lock picking, traps. So I think that you can find that either with a rogue or a monk. I prefer rogues. I also think that rogues can be, they can easily go ranged or melee. So they can kind of be a floater in that sense when it comes to combat. They can either fight alongside the fighter or attack from afar, do some range stuff, hiding in the shadows. Gotta have healing. It's an absolute necessity. And so you've got, you know, I, I think that between the healers, I think the cleric's going to be the best. Going back to that idea of having somebody kind of a floater, that's great with clerics too because clerics can act like tanks. They can operate like fighters and big bulky damage takers and dealers. So it's always nice to throw a cleric in there and then great that, you know, I think they have the best healing. Plus with wisdom, they can be your eyes and ears, right? That's necessary. And then for the fourth, none of the previous classes that I mentioned have charisma. So I'm putting the bard in the last spot. So, you know, they can be the mouthpiece and they can also float with any of those positions, right? Bards can heal a little bit. Bards can do a little bit of combat. They can do so either ranged or melee. 
So I think you've definitely got some options there for that being your fourth. So for me, it's going to be fighter, rogue, cleric, and bard. I think that's like the quintessential makeup for a four-player party. You see what some of the people in chat are saying. Hey, Kirk, what's going on? No worries. You're here, so you're not late. Is the answer four different kinds of clerics or maybe one or two paladins? Rogues disarm traps, monks dodge traps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd much rather, you know, it's great for the monk if they avoid it, but I'd much rather have somebody that can disarm it. Wizard, paladin, rogue, and druid. That's pretty great. You know, the thing that's great about druids, just in general, is that they can double as your tank. I've discovered that playing one in Baldur's Gate 3, and there's a lot of stuff that's happened. We're, you know, we're several weeks ahead when it comes to that, if anybody's watching the Baldur's Gate 3 Dark Urge playthrough. I want to say we're like four or five episodes are in the can, so to speak, meaning we've already played them, just haven't released them. So there's a lot of stuff coming up where you'll see me doing some tanky stuff as a druid. So that's cool. And then wizards are like super busted, but... I guess your paladin's your healer there. Yeah, I'm loving the Spore Druid, man. It's a really, really fun build. And I'm starting to get better at... I'm getting better at it, like figuring out how to use it. As a monk in a party without a rogue, I went through all the traps and triggered them and evaded. I took the barbarian eating like five exploding doors <laughs> before they let me take all the doors. Um, as a GM, class composition doesn't matter to me at all. I tailor the campaign to the players. Yeah, for sure. And I feel that. Like, I, I guess that, you know, I assumed that my ideal party composition, that would be as a player. As a DM, I don't really care. I mean, I guess that, like, an ideal party would be one without a healer, just because that would probably be the easiest to exploit. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, as a GM, as a, as a DM, I don't really care. Paladin, Rogue, Druid, Bard. Paladin and Druid can heal. Yeah, and that's a thing that I've discovered too as the Druid, is that I'm a bit of a healer. I, I can, which is really nice. In fact, I think the helmet that I have on grants me additional HP if I heal somebody, which is cool. But yeah, that's between the, because our party in the Baldur's Gate 3 run through is a fighter, a monk, a bard, and a Druid. And between me and Cody the bard, we can do enough of the healing that's necessary so yeah druid's good too maybe druid instead of cleric if if i was pressed but clerics clerics heals i think overall are better you can tank heal and be magic dps depends on the number of players but never force someone to play a class they don't like yeah definitely like as a gm i would never say like you have to play this oh and i don't know why i just thought of this but i was reminded of it this is a cool thing i made a tiktok about this people who aren't on the clock app might not have seen it but I made a TikTok recently, had this idea, and it's I'm sure that it's been had before, and some people may have heard it, but some people haven't. So here's the idea. So you you have your players. This is, by the way, I should preface this by saying this is more for players who have experience. <clears throat> I wouldn't necessarily recommend this if you were new to the game or if on if you're on like your second campaign or something. But if you're somebody that's play, been playing for years and years, this is a really cool exercise is you have the players make the characters for each other. So you set it up kind of like a Secret Santa thing, where like in Session Zero, everybody is given, everybody is assigned a player that they will make their make the character for, but you keep it entirely anonymous. Nobody knows who's building whose character. And then you have them build the characters out, create their backstories, etc. And then in Session 1... Well, maybe you'd probably have to do it at the end of Session Zero because you'd have to give them time to get adjusted to the character. But you distribute the characters to their appropriate players. And then you just kind of go from there. And I have sort of experience with that kind of in when we did the Wii Play, we didn't build those characters, right? We did a thing called the Draft where we had um, a bunch of fans send in characters, pre-written characters, and then we put them in numbers in a bowl and then drew from it randomly and then that's the character we got and that was super fun because you kind of go into it blind and then you just kind of have to adapt um, as a player I really don't care about class composition generally expect the GM won't punish us for not having a specific role covered yeah that's true 
If Paladins weren't so difficult to play in some versions, looking at you, 3-5, I'd always just Paladin since, yeah, the different oaths can do different cool things. You want your players... You want your players to play what they'll enjoy playing and not what not want to give up on when things get tough. Bard in 5e isn't the arcane servant they were in 3-5, so I'd want wizard over bard as the last slot just because it's often necessary. That's true, yeah. They're not uh, the arcane savant, by the way, not servant. Yeah, that's true. I do think that like from a magical standpoint, I think probably in 5e because they really leaned into the whole jack-of-all-trades thing with the bard and then the way that they changed like the inspiration and stuff. So, yeah, so that's just something to put out there for DMs if you want to spruce, uh, shake things up with your existing party, spice it up, I guess. You could just uh, do that because that's pretty cool. All right, she whiz. Well, thanks for the question, River. We've, we've got to keep moving. I can't believe it. We've, I've got more questions. So thanks for that one. According to the list of names, the next question is from Amanda. Oh, and this one's fun. Uh, let's see. Amanda asks... Good evening, Bard. I had a couple of questions for you. If you could choose any movie to turn into a D&D campaign, which movie would you choose? Same question, but with a TV show. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for the question, Amanda. So, TV show, I thought of immediately. Battlestar Galactica or Firefly. I think either one of those has crazy legs for a D&D campaign. Um, but... Uh, BSG in particular, I think, would be super dope because you could have some, one or some of the party members be a Cylon. In particular, if someone was like a sleeper Cylon and they didn't know it until like the very end, that would be way cool. Um, Firefly, there's just so much opportunity for that, for a story. And that's why I think it's so sad it got canceled because... That show, just the general foundation of that show and what it was, it was like Star Trek. They could have made 10 seasons of that show. Um, so it's really unfortunate that it didn't get through. And then for movies, I said Clockwork Orange comes to mind just because it's my favorite movie. Look, kind of the idea of being like a criminal teenage gang and like fighting other teenage gangs. Maybe or something like The Warriors. But I do also like the idea of doing like a bigger one, something more in depth, like a world like Dune or maybe Equilibrium. And I saw somebody say, did somebody say Equilibrium? Because we talked about that movie last week. Yeah, yeah, Pirate. That would be a really cool, really cool play. Uh, let's see what else chat's saying. Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> oh, man, J Justin would love that. 24, Fifth Element. Oh, that's a really good one. Fifth Element would be super dope. Monty Python. Let's be honest. Most D&D &D campaigns devolve into Monty Python within the first few sessions. Uh, TV show The A-Team. Maybe. That could be cool. Like if you did like a modern. Monty Python movie, Princess Bride. The Thing would make a great one shot. Yeah, it would. That would be... Matter of fact... Is there a John Carpenter RPG? Because there should be. Just a John Carpenter RPG. Breaking Bad for a show. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be, I feel like you could, put, you could put that kind of skin into any of those modern campaigns. As long as everyone is playing what they like or they're good at my table, we'll be happily excited to come back next week. Ooh, The Dark Crystal. That's good. Old boy. Yeah, you know what else I was thinking about? The Raid 2. Or... I don't know. There's so many. Road to El Dorado. Oh, that is true. That is a rogue and a bard. Just on a side... Uh, just on a quest. So that could be pretty neat. I don't know. I think that there's... <sighs> Some of that stuff is like already like stuff like Lord of the Rings. It's like that's kind of already the basis. So for me, I thought of like sci-fi. I, I can't believe I didn't think of the Fifth Element. That's a great answer. That's a cool movie. Clockwork Orange has so much more to it, though. The psychological subversion of the main's violent tendencies could make for a good plot too. That's true. You could very well do like a Clockwork Orange type plot line where that's that's an NPC. 
or a DMPC, like the placeholder that is Alex. Maybe not Alex specifically, but you know, to your point, like the 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 main the main character has these violent tendencies, and that's basically like what the whole plot is about, right? Is that it's like you know better for a man to be good and controlled, or to have free will and be evil, all that stuff. So, yeah, I think that there's a lot you could do with that with each of the players. Maybe it's a thing where it's like they have chips or something, so you could might kind of modernize it. The Muppets, oh yeah. The Crow, that's really cool. Uh, by the way, have y'all seen the trailer for the new Crow? I think it looks pretty cool. I don't know why people are giving... I, I think they should give Skarsgård a chance. Listen, anybody that's a fan of The Crow, it's like, I can't imagine you seeing the trailer for the new one and being like, whoa, that looks stupid. And it's like, really? Can't be any dumber than like the f four or five movies they made after the first one. Don't get me wrong, I'm a Crow fan. And like the the nostalgia and the kid in me like loves those movies. But let's not pretend that like the third or the fourth Crow movie were any good. <laughs> I think that the and I do think now more than ever there's a chance for it to be good because I feel like production houses have been rec they've recognized the value in sticking towards the source material. Star Trek or Star Wars, Willy Wonka. Yeah, I see a lot of Monty Python. Man, maybe it's just my group, but I feel like Monty Python is just kind of always the standard. Wizard of Oz, that could be cool. Okay, well, that's enough of that. Uh, the Mask. Old School Mission Impossible, that'd be neat. Or like, uh, or maybe like a detective series. Adventure Time, Robin Hood, Mid and Tights. All right, we got to keep it moving because we've got more questions to get to. But thank you for the question, Amanda. That was fun. And a lot of cool recommendations. Oh, Babylon 5. I didn't see that earlier. Yeah, that's a good one. No Crow fan acknowledges the others. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's like 4E. It's just like we don't talk about that. All right, so the next question, according to the list of names, is from Chris. Oh, Scarface, too. Yeah, that'd be fun. That was essentially Grand Theft Auto Vice City with Scarface. Um, next question is from Chris. Chris asks, with the possible banning of TikTok on the horizon, how do you think this will affect the algorithm? Will short form content go out of favor? Thank you for the question, Chris. <sighs> Listen, I don't think short form content's going anywhere. I think that the Zoomers and Gen Alpha, that's what they like. That's what they want. You know, the the I think that the desire for short form content existed before TikTok, C Vine. I, I think that they like they I think that they do like stuff like streaming because they appreciate the realness, like the one on one, like people being genuine, like these kind of shows. I think people relate to, especially like the younger generation, because I've always said to I feel like the, the generation behind me the zoomers and the and gen alpha they never bought they never bought it right like they 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 recognize that they recognize what time it was and and what the world was at a very young age and so they've not been disillusioned to any of it so as a result they can see through bullshit pretty quickly and pretty effectively and we're going to require them to do that for us when it comes to ai stuff but i think just in general Short form is, it's here to stay. And more than anything, I think TikTok's value comes from not only its algorithmic capabilities, because it's clearly superior to, superior to YouTube in terms of learning what you like and then, and then feeding that to you. But also the thing about TikTok, and I was just talking about this recently with somebody, is that TikTok is like how Twitter was in like 2008, where it's the front page of news when it comes to getting unbiased info. Because what's great about TikTok is if something's going on like, you know, this unfortunate bridge, uh, this bridge accident in Baltimore or anything really this the stuff that's going on in these wars all over the world like the similar to how twitter was back in the day 
because, I mean, now it's kind of like a different thing. But when Twitter first came out, it was a big deal because you had real people on the ground being able to just put data out into the ether like never before. Whereas like when I was even when I was in high school, like if you wanted news, it was on the TV or in the newspaper and on like a couple of websites. But then Twitter came along and it's like, oh, well, this is great because now instead of like hearing some news anchor say it who might have their own, you know, they have their own contracts and things they're supposed to say for sponsors and stuff, as opposed to just a guy who's like, hey, so I'm in the hospital and this is what's going on. And so TikTok is just an expansion of that. And so I said recently on a TikTok I made, actually, because it was this stupid congressman to being talked talking about it about how like oh we got to be really careful because it's propaganda and it's like dude it's not any more propaganda than what's already going on in america and with these like social media companies like it's like oh no what could happen they could steal our data well we know that facebook already did that and everybody still uses facebook so the idea that we would get rid of TikTok because it's like, oh, man, it's it's dangerous. It's like, yeah, it's probably dangerous because I've learned more stuff on it in the last couple of years than I did in the previous decade. Just because you have access to more people. So instead of like turning on the news and seeing what they're saying about, I don't know, anything. I can just I can flip through TikTok and see a person. And now, obviously, you need to you need to verify. You can't just like see a TikTok and then go tell somebody that it's news. Obviously, you should double check and 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 do research as to like what the real story is, because usually everybody's got a little bit of the truth. But these people on TikTok, it's like they're right there. You can just see it. So. I, I, my, my answer is I don't, I don't think that the, the anything's going to change from an algorithmic standpoint. I think YouTube is, but then again, YouTube is notorious for changing things. Who's to say that they don't ban TikTok and then it's like, we can't get access to TikTok. And then YouTube says, okay, well then we're going to get rid of shorts. I mean, that might, that would probably be foolish of them because somebody would just fill that void. But let me see. I've been kind of rambling. Let me see what Chad's saying. There's always been some sort of short form radio comedy commercials on TV. Yeah, I've, I've talked about it before. I think too. Somebody told me. I think they're called. It used to be called blackout comedy. I heard. I think Jordan Peele talking about it, where that was like a real thing back in like the vaudeville days. The idea of like a thirty second bit. It was just they would people would run between other acts, so somebody would just come on the stage and they would do like. 40 seconds or whatever, and then they would leave. And it was like, oh, well, that's like, you know, that's the original TikTok. It's not about your data. It's about money. Of course, it's all about money. You know, I heard, by the way, that it's Bezos and Amazon that are spearheading this TikTok ban because Timu is undercutting their bottom line. Which wouldn't surprise me, by the way. I will say that TikTok is much more clever about ads. Maybe it's because I'm getting old, or maybe it's just because they're getting better at it. But I do occasionally find myself, you know, 15 seconds into a video where I'm like, oh, wait a minute, this is an ad. <laughs> this isn't some guy in his, in his house. This is just, he's just trying to sell something. Beyond YouTube, don't do social media anymore. Yeah, I really don't either. Like, you could find me, like, on Discord or on YouTube or on TikTok. But beyond that... I don't, you know, I, I go on Instagram like once a week. Same with Facebook. The only reason I'm really on Facebook is to like post channel stuff. So no way YouTube's going to get rid of shorts, even if TikTok ban goes through. I expect to see YouTube short surge in popularity. Yeah, well, because everybody is going. And that's kind of already happening, right? Like a lot of the stuff on shorts is just stuff that's like was on TikTok a year ago. <laughs> like there are people in my life that send me stuff on Instagram or even will send me like YouTube shorts and it's like, bro, look at this. And it's like, yeah, that happened like last March. But again, it seems like that's probably why they want, that's one of the reasons likely that the powers that be want to ban it is because it's like too much, too much free information going on. They can't control it. It's too fast and too much of it. So they don't like that. They they want to control that. Can't even find you on the Discord much. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, I'm I'm a busy bee. I'm tired of shorts. I want long form stuff to run in the background. Yeah, and I'm that way too. You know, I listen to a lot of long form content where I just kind of have stuff. Uh, you know, I put on I'll put on like a good mythical morning playlist or like the basement yard or dudesy or any of the podcasts that I listen to and just let it run in the back. 
short attention spans. People love shorts. Yeah. And I think that Generation Z and Generation Alpha were kind of programmed that way because while my generation was slowly introduced to the internet through our teens, they've just had devices in their hands since they were toddlers. So I'm on Facebook out of habit. Only got it for old uh, family, high school friends. Don't even like it anymore. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's funny about that is like when first Facebook first came out, it was like, oh, look, you can you can connect with all of these old people. And it's like, yeah, but like <laughs> I'm not connected with them now. There's a re like it's like, check it out. Look, it's all the people you went to high school with. It's like, yeah, I don't really like many people that I went to high school with. The, the people that I went to high school with that I like, I'm still in contact with. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need a, a, a social media. So it is nice for being in touch with family, I suppose, like over long distances. But other than that, eh. Really like ASMR maker videos for background noise. Putting on Explore with us. It's a crime documentary channel in the style of JCS. It's great when I'm grinding in the game. That's cool. Yeah, I like stuff where I can just kind of put it on and it just keeps playing. But... Yeah, I don't, I don't think short form's going anywhere. And as to whether or not YouTube would change the algorithm, they might. I mean, they do it all the time. It wouldn't be crazy. But I don't think that they'll change what they're doing with shorts. Some people don't even have an email, only an Instagram or equivalent. That That is bizarre to me because I've had an email since I was like 10 or something. Maybe not that young, but at least like 12 or 13. Like when we first started getting into the... You know, when we first started getting logging in on AOL, doing the doing the dial up thing with the guy running across the thing, <laughs> that was you know I had email then. When I first joined Facebook, you need a college email. Yeah, I remember that. Came back from deployment and it ex and it exploded to take any email. Yeah, I remember that. I remember when I signed up on Facebook for the first time because I'm from the MySpace era. When I was in high school, it was about MySpace, and man, I miss it. And I'm sure that part of that memory is tied up with the nostalgia of being younger, but also I just think that MySpace was infinitely cooler. I think Facebook like seemed attractive and then just kind of took over, and it sucks because MySpace was way better. But yeah, I remember when Facebook first came out, you had to have a college. I remember like I had to add my my small local community college onto it to do it, <laughs> so because it wasn't on there. But then yeah, like within a year or two, it was just like anybody can join. It was like oh okay. Um, you should double post your TikToks to YouTube. Yeah, I really should. I should do that. I should start doing that. It's so hard. That's so annoying, too. And I'm sure that there's a website where it's like, all you got to do is post your video one time and we'll send it everywhere. And it's like, that would be super convenient. But it is kind of annoying that everything's so compartmentalized where it's like, oh, yeah, you got to post it on YouTube. And then don't forget to put it on TikTok. And you can also put it on Instagram. And like, ugh. But that is a good point, though, that I do agree with. I should, because I, I do like my TikToks and have fun making them, and I, it wouldn't be too much too much extra work for me to just pop them up onto YouTube for people to see them there. Okay. So thank you for the question. Uh, let's see. Totally, I kind of got off on, like, a rant there, but, you know, I feel strongly about some of this stuff. Uh, the next question is from Ruby. And Ruby asks... Our DM nephew and his real-life witch, just like me, are getting married in Toronto at a place called Heart House. Picture a great hall in any castle. So they are asking for dance music, and I know they love your music. So what song would you and your wife dance for your wedding? Well, thank you for the question, Ruby. This is a picture, for anyone interested, of the place, Heart Hall, or Heart House, excuse me. Yep, hard house. It looks pretty cool. It is very castly. My wife and I had a very small, intimate wedding. It was just the two of us in a local park with a uh, with an ordained woman who just performed the the a basic ceremony for us. And then, for us, I think we rather uh, we would rather spend the money on the honeymoon, which we did where we honeymooned in Denver, which was wonderful and a great time. So neither of us, uh, you know, if we were to do so, um, first of all, congrats to your nephew, by the way. I missed that in there. That's great. 
my, neither my wife and I are huge dancers and both of us, you know, we preferred more of the intimate tip and less of like the big deal stuff. But I would say it was fun to think of the songs that we would probably dance to. So I was going through some of them. I think that probably we probably wouldn't do anything to my songs because at least most of the music that I have released is is hip hop. There are a couple of acoustics. I really should probably just release the acoustic album this year and just get those pieces recorded and out just so that there are other forms of, you know, the uh, (laughs) other forms of music that I make. You know, I've said before, like, I'm going to try and make a Christmas album this year and then also, like, start getting to, like, bardcore, like, fantasy music maybe that people can use in their campaigns. But... For for any of the other songs, oh, well, I was going to say, probably wouldn't be any of my songs, but if they were, it would probably be like one of the slower, like more emotional ones, like Song of Rest or Power Word Kill, um, maybe even Power Word Heal, which is from Join the Party, because that one speaks, I think, a lot about my life. Um, For other songs, probably something like Disney, like from Encanto, there's a really beautiful song called Dos Urug. Oh, man, I'm going to butcher this because I'm not good at Spanish. Dos Uruguitas, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, it's like a love song. Maybe something from like Bed Knobs and Broomsticks or like The Hunchback. Or maybe even like Hercules or Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And also, I just put a note on this too. Like the short answer is we danced to whatever my wife wanted to dance to. Um Speaking of which, that actually reminds me of another TikTok I made and another good point about why I need to post my TikToks on YouTube. I'm, I don't know if anybody else experiences this, but I get really annoyed when other men who are married talk to me like I can relate to them not liking their wives. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people will come and people will say stuff to me like, oh, yeah, you know, the old ball and chain. And I'm like. I I can't relate to it to that man. I love my wife. I she's my best friend. She's the person that I want to spend all of my time with. Like I it's I'm sorry that you're dealing with that, but like there are guys that treat that like it's this universal thing where it's like, "Hey, yeah, you know, the the old wife." And it's like, "Don't stop doing that. My wife's great." Like I'm sorry that you don't like your wife. That sounds like a problem you need to work out. But <laughs> yeah, that's um that's a thing. So, yeah, I think any of those, the, the probably anything Disney or just maybe something like nice from the 90s that we have some nostalgia about, like something like MXPX or Green Day or something. Sounds like a D&D episode. <laughs> My, yeah, I can't relate. My wife is an amazing woman. Yeah, exactly. Macho bullshit. Yeah, probably. The girl from Empanema. What's that one song that's like Constantinople? I forget the I forget the name of the other word, or, or I forget the name of the other place. Istanbul, not Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. When are we gonna get Miss Bart advice for a guest star? Oh man, I'm not sure. My wife's not much on the whole uh, <laughs> the whole entertainment bit, but maybe maybe one day. I know my hubby's song that we danced to in the hotel room at the honeymoon. Something just like this by Coldplay and the Chainsmokers. They might be giants. Yeah. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. For our wedding, everyone was wondering why Ron and I weren't nervous. Nervous? Nervous about what? I went to Belton Lake Outdoor Recreation Area for the weekend for my honeymoon 2008. Belton Lake? Is that in Texas, Pirate? You know, I've got family from Belton, or in that area. Maybe they're not anymore, but at one point. Oh, but you know, the missus wouldn't let us do that. No, no idea on that. (laughs) Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just, uh, people tend to trauma dump on me, too. I don't know what that's about. Maybe it's just because it seems like I'm like, maybe I don't seem, maybe I don't appear as like a threat. I don't know. Or it could just be that I'm, like, friendly generally. But, man, people really will just, like, strangers will just be like, let me tell you about this. And then they'll just talk to me for, like, ten minutes about, like, really personal stuff. And it's like, all right, (laughs) well, that's fine. 
Raph and I first bonded over a very obscure electro-industrial artist named Wumpscott. So our winning song is one of his slower tracks. That's cool. Yes, it is. If you read up, you got in the Bell County Courthouse. Oh, okay. Well, cool. Well, thank you for the question, Ruby. Hope that gives you somewhat of an answer there. We have two more questions. There's a follow-up, and I'm going to do things a little differently, too, this week, just because, like I said, I kind of want the last question to lead us into chat chat. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this question to talk about this, and then we're going to do the follow-up, which is actually in reference to a question from last week, and then we're going to do the last question which will hopefully lead us into chat chat pretty seamlessly. So thank you for the question, Ruby. The next question is from Mark and Mark asks, Hey Chaz, you've spoken before about the Assassin's Creed game series being some of your favorite games. Indeed. Do you have a favorite, a least favorite? Would love to see you stream one of them sometime. Thanks. Thank you for the question, Mark. Yes, I do need to figure out what I'm doing with the streaming and if that's, in fact, something I'm even going to do. I do want to do it. It's just a matter of finding the time and setting aside the time to do it. But, yes, the Assassin's Creed games. Oh, boy, howdy. Some of my favorite. I remember when the first one came out, and I just couldn't stop playing it. I thought it was so cool. I think that they were the first ones really on that... What's it called? Counter... Was that like was that the one of the first like counter systems in combat in real time combat like being able to counter that way? Because I remember that the Batman game did it, but I don't remember what came out first. Somebody look that up, could you? I think the first Assassin's Creed came out in like oh six, and then that maybe that Batman game came out in oh seven or oh eight. Should do streaming? Yeah, I know I should. I haven't played any Assassin's Creed games. Oh, man, you're missing out. I, you know what's funny? I haven't played Black Flag myself, and I do keep hearing great things about that. I really should just get it and play it. What I might do is just maybe I'll just, on my own channel, uh, or maybe on this one, I don't know, who knows, stream, just go through all the Assassin's Creed Creed games. It'd be cool to do them like in order. Because there is, there's obviously the order that they were released, but there is, and my buddy Bobby and I were looking into it the other day, there is an order of how they occurred, obviously from a historical standpoint. But I think Origins is the first in the list of, from like a chronological standpoint, I think Origins happens first. And then Odyssey, because in Origins and Odyssey, the Templars don't really exist as much as it's just kind of like there's these groups of bad people. Assassin's Creed in 07 and Batman in 09. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was the... Fir- Thank you for looking that up. That was the first... Uh, Assassin's Creed was, to my to my memory, the first game where you could counter like that in real-time combat. And what a cool thing. Because I got to a place where I didn't even... I wasn't... I didn't even attack... I was I never I never was even offensive. I would just get into a group. I would get into a fight and then just stand there, and just wait. Um, at this point, you're gonna stay to the end. Oh well, well thank you. We appreciate it. Um, so okay, so you asked me about my favorite. So my favorite, my favorite, is Syndicate. Of the ones that I've played, Syndicate's my favorite. It's set in like uh, mid 1800s uh, London. At the time of Jack the Ripper, there's DLC where you can do this whole Jack the Ripper storyline. I think Syndicate's super cool just because of, it. for one, it was the first one that I think it's the first one where you could play as a woman, which is great. Because like I do that whenever I get a chance because I think we need more cool, badass female characters. So any opportunity that I get to, I play as a woman. And so in Syndicate... You don't get to exclusively play as her, but your your main characters that you play as are twins and a Jacob and Evie, and you can switch back and you switch back and forth between them throughout uh, the game. I love all the like city gangs and stuff, and how you can hire them. Just like the whole feel of that one is really great. I love I love all the games. Um, the only one that I didn't love was three. And that's mostly just about how it 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 started. There was a, there's a lot of exposition at the beginning of three, 
right? Because, like, we played the first one, obviously, and then the second one came out, and it was super cool. And then I never really played Brotherhood, although I really should and want to. And then when 3 came out, I played 3, and man, boy, howdy, you you play, like, three hours before you even really start the game. And that was annoying. And then even through the, even through, it wasn't very memorable for me. Whereas, like, Syndicate is super memorable. And then also I was going to point out that I've been playing Origins. That's the one that I'm currently playing. I played Odyssey recently, but for the last couple of weeks I've been playing Origins. And that's the Egyptian one. It's way cool. I've really enjoyed that one. The ones, I've not played Black Flag and I should and want to. I've not played Brotherhood and should and want to. Unity was okay. I haven't played Valhalla. Should and want to. Finally watch Ghostbusters. Oh my gosh. Well, what's happening, Justin? Thanks for stopping in, buddy. How you doing? Love you too, man. I'm glad that you watch Ghostbusters. Gee whiz. You know what you need to do, bro, is watch uh, Back to the Future while you're at it. Weird thing about Assassin's Creed is that it's both historical and realistic, but then also fantastic, unrealistic physics, a weird mix. Yeah, that's actually my favorite thing about the Assassin's Creed games. So um, I was going to say I've been recently playing Origins, and that's been really fun because my wife's a big history buff. And in fact, some of her favorite things to study and, and watch, le she watches these lectures on like ancient Rome and Greece and Egypt. So that's been really cool because the games are relatively historically accurate, at least from like a geographical standpoint. It's my understanding they have like whole teams of historians on staff where they try to make it as realistic as possible as to when it was. That was so that's what was so cool about Unity is because like when there was the unfortunate burning of Notre Dame a few years ago, Ubisoft, which I believe that it is supposed to be pronounced Ubisoft, even though I called it Ubisoft for a long time. They um, they just gave Unity away to people, which was really nice because you could because that's the one that's set in um, set at Notre Dame, set in Paris. So you can go to Notre Dame and view it as it was, which is a really cool thing. Blasphemy. Oh, yeah. It's not seen back in the future. I know. I'm telling you, that's like a big one. Uh, uh, finally saw the Goonies, but hadn't seen Jurassic Park. Yeah, you gotta watch Jurassic Park and Back to the Future ASAP, pal. Those are those are staples. Do you think Jewel chose their spelling because of Zool? Maybe. There is no there is no geek bar. The only only Jewel. Been streaming Ripper Street. It's like an R-rated Murdoch mystery based on Whitechapel, London. Oh, that sounds really dope. <laughs> there is no chest and only Zool. We've lost him. You thought Liberation had the first woman assassin. Assassin's is that a is that a game? Hold on. Hold please. Oh. Whoa. How did I miss this? French Louisiana. I didn't even know that this existed. Was it released when was it released in America? It looks like it was released in Japan. Uh, it was released in 2014 in America. Oh, no, no, no. It was released in, tw in 2012. Huh. Man, well, now I know which one I really want to play. Thank you. I <laughs> I didn't even know that existed. I want to write that down. Write that down. Okay. So, thank you for the question on the Assassin's Creed. That was really fun. I really like those games, and I recommend them highly to anybody if they've not played them. So, the we're going to do the follow-up, and, geez, now, one moment, because I want to look up, I've forgotten, unfortunately, the name of the person who asked about their, oh, it was David. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was... It wasn't Chris. Oh, it was Chester. Chester Vile. Chesterville. Chester Vile. That was the original question. This is a follow-up in regard to that. So if you, if you weren't here last week, we got a question, and it was about um, this guy who's making his own D20 game. 
And so this is a follow-up in regard to that from John. And so John says, I only have one piece of advice gleaned from judging board game design competitions. Don't only play test with your group, play test with others. I mean complete strangers. Give the rules to someone and have them read cold and try to run a game. If the designer is there, any assumptions you or your group made will be exposed when teaching new people. I don't play D&D, but I do enjoy your show forever in GURPS. <laughs> well, thank you, John. I appreciate the follow-up. And that is a really good point about that, Chester. So if you're listening, I tend to agree. And maybe we said that last week, but definitely just want to like reiterate on that. That's a really good point is giving it to strangers, maybe finding like a local FLGS or something where you could go and just kind of give people the stuff and then just... You know, it can be, believe me, as a creator, I know it can be really difficult to like let go. But really, I think that's that's something that would serve you really well is for you to just give it to people who have no they have no bias and they have no background with it. So whereas your players, it's like they already know what time it is. They've probably been playing it with you for a while. These strangers, they just go in blind and it's just like, here, here are the rules. Can you figure this out? And it's like. Well, that that will expose all of those things because they're and it's and it'll it'll expose things that you never think about because again, there's no bias there, they don't have any background, so they're just approaching it from the perspective of a brand new player, which is what people that would be buying it from you in the future would be doing. So, you want to make sure that all of that stuff is accounted for. Um, when I translate my campaign into a module form, would you guys want to test it? Oh, yeah, that would be super dope. I'd totally be down. Are you sure it's not, Chris? Yeah. No, I'm sure. It's odd that it isn't from a statistical standpoint, right? Because you would think, like, well, if it's a question from this podcast, there's probably like a 40% chance that it's from Chris. <laughs> but, yeah, I would totally be down for that, River. That sounds really cool. Give it to the murder hobos and min-maxers. Yeah, for sure. Find the Sarahs. Find the... Find the power gamers because they'll 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 figure out the exploits immediately. They'll the from jump they'll be like, oh, what if I could do this? And then you could be like, oh, wait a minute, there's not even a rule for that, or we have to have a rule against that because it messes up the game or something. Uh, love all your videos. I follow you. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hope that our hope that our content brings you joy. That's always the goal. Then it looks like I will have to get my. Get over my aversion to playing D&D online. Yeah, you might have to, River. We might have to figure something out with Roll20. I think Jay and Ethan and some people have been playing D&D, unbeknownst to me, in the shadows. But I don't, I don't know. I get it. Because, like, with me, it's like anybody that... It, I'm, I'm, I'm difficult to play games with because, like, with me, it's like I'm always trying to think of the angle as to, like, monetizing it. <laughs> it's just because, like, the nature of being a creator that earns my living this way, it's just like, oh, yeah, cool, we could play D&D. So, like, as long as we could, like, film it and, like, monetize it. <laughs> play in the Discord. And I have Tailspire. I just never use it. Oh, okay. As a bit of a power gamer myself, I always go through a process of figuring out how I can break something when I after I write it. Yeah. Most definitely. And that's a good point that John said, having it from a stranger, somebody that doesn't have really any stake in the game, they'll be honest with you. They'll be able to see where you're, where the problems are. Um, it'll make it easier for you to address. Okay, so thank you for that follow-up, John. Uh, we've got this last question of the evening, which is from David. That was the confusion earlier. This question is from David, and it's gonna be it's gonna get us into chat chat. And this is a thing where I'm really gonna want to hear from people in chat too. So strap in and buckle up. We're gonna talk about this stuff. So David asks, "Hey Yaz, I'm sure you saw the recent news about Sean Diddy Combs' residences being raided. As a hip hop fan and a writer who raps, <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Do you think we'll see more crimes from other celebrities come to light?" Thank you in advance. Thank you for the question, David. You're not the only one that asked about this. I had a feeling that a question about this would be coming, and we're going to talk about it. So I'll just say this. And actually, River said it to me earlier in a really great way, and I totally agree with him. So I just kind of put it to this. Like, 50 tried to tell us. Eminem has tried to tell us things over the years. Cat Williams has certainly been trying to tell people for over a decade about all of that stuff. 50's hilarious, by the way. Oh, my God. He's just been, like, dragging Diddy on social. It's so funny. Like, 50's just the best. What exactly happened? So, Diddy... And here's the thing, too. And I'll just say this. This is just true. 
I've never really liked Diddy. Even when he was like Puff Daddy, I never really like... So for me, I'm a Pac fan. I'm a huge, like, I'm on, like, the like late 80s, early 90s tip when it comes to hip-hop. Like, Tupac, Eric B., and Rakim, the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, A Tribe Called Quest, etc. All of that great stuff. People like KRS-One. Oh, by the way, there's a TikTok with Fat Joe talking about it, too, which is really insightful. But... I've, I, there was for some reason like I never really I never really liked Diddy and uh, you know I, I'm a I'm a Pac fan first I obviously respect and appreciate Biggie and like Biggie but so basically what happened is the Diddy <laughs> careful son says law your mom for sure the the Diddy's houses got raided in Miami and in Los Angeles. And evidently this is part of a sex trafficking investigation. We don't know a lot of the details of what's going on, but it appears that Mr. Combs is involved in some pretty criminal stuff. And this of course is coming off the heels of this documentary that's come off of the, uh, the, the, on the set I'm not sure if anybody has seen any of this stuff. The uh, the Quiet on Set, the Dark Side of Kids TV that's been airing on, I guess, Investigative Discovery, but we've been watching it on, I forget what it's on, maybe Max. Um, yes, it's important to note that all of this stuff is alleged, right? Like nobody, you know, that's kind of how it works in this place as people are, are, are innocent until proven guilty. But. Yes, this is a thing where people have kind of, and, and I'll be honest, like a lot of my black friends like already knew this. Like I, a lot of the people that I'm friends with were like, yeah, we've we've been on this. And there's definitely something weird about him that's going on. Cat Williams in his interview on Shannon Sharp told everybody that 2024 was going to be a, a massive year for this kind of stuff all coming out and unfolding. So... It seems like with most of these scum, there's always people that know about it. Yeah, I know. And the the quiet on set thing has been really tough for me to watch because I grew up with that stuff, right? Like all that, specifically the the show, all that, and stuff like Keenan and Kel, those were probably some of like my first my first interactions with content that made me want to be an entertainer, right? Because like all that from was the precursor to SNL. When I was a kid, that's what it was. And so it's been incredibly difficult to go back on that and and see all of that stuff. And also to feel like that's the toughest for me is that so many of the people seem to be so flippant about like knowing what was going on, but then like not doing anything about it. And I understand there's there's. It's complicated, right? It's not just as easy as, as like, you see something, you say something. But I don't know. Like, at least for me, like, the way that I was raised, like, if anything is seems weird, you just kind of just kind of get away from that. I've never been into – I've, I've never been – I've never really liked Diddy that much. And I'll be honest, I wouldn't be totally shocked if we saw some weird stuff come out about Drake either. That's, that's another one where I'm kind of like, mm, is that going to happen? Looking back, Nick's shows were so creepy, for sure. And we couldn't tell when we were kids, right? And there was no reason, at least for me, like getting into high school and then afterwards to be watching any of that stuff. So a lot of it I've never, I haven't even seen in years. It was in through watching this docu series that a lot of that stuff's come to light. And obviously, there's multiple sides to the story. It's, you know, I'm not, I'm not ever the kind of person to just like take some data and just run with it. Obviously, more stuff will come out. Heard about this on last news, last news. Yeah, it's still lots of crazy stuff. Um, no, it was obvious. Yeah, I, I will say this like. I think that it's I think that the onus of justice is going to be on the millennial generation in terms of like letting people know who may have been victims of these crimes that it's okay to talk about it and to come forward and to name names because that stuff is that stuff's got to get sorted for you know you're talking about an entire generation of people who have been having to deal with that and and all of that stuff coming out like for us older ones finding out the truth about different strokes. Yeah. The, it's, listen, 
the evil is everywhere and hurt people hurt people. And there's a lot of untreated trauma walking around this planet. And so I just hope that justice is brought for, you know, whatever it is. There, there's still an investigation to be done. I imagine that a lot more is going to come out because allegedly Diddy had a lot of hidden cameras in his house. Diddy was known for filming everything, all, all lots of things. There have been people that are neighbors of him that have come out and said some things. So it'll all come out in court. It probably won't be for another year or two because that's just the nature of things slowly unfolding. But yeah, I don't know. I think maybe this is, maybe us being so connected as a species is, I think that these are some of the hard things that we have to go through, but I think that they're necessary because it's like we can't continue along this, we can't continue, in my opinion, I don't think we can continue along this trek where money is the most important thing, and if you have it, that's all that matters. Because I think we've seen where that gets us. <laughs> both economically and morally, too. Because it's like, well, hold on a minute, wait. These people that were like our heroes, these like celebrities are maybe participating in horrible crimes. That's problematic. Because it's it's more than just like my generation, but it's the ones after. And you've got people that are looking up to these people as role models for how to live. The phone dumps will be amazing, most definitely. And footage, just footage in general, when it's just like, oh, yeah, here, this is out there. It's going to get really wild. And I will say this, too. I think it's going to get way worse before it gets better. And it's definitely like don't meet your heroes to the max. I was devastated when everything came out about Stephen Collins because of Seventh Heaven. Strife, struggle, and suffering is how all things evolved. It's evolved. It sucks, but that's nature. No matter how civilized we become, we're still animals. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that that is the... It's it's a double-edged sword. Because on the one... You know, it's, it's something that's necessary, but it's also something that's incredibly difficult, and we all just kind of have to deal. So that's been really unfortunate. But I would highly recommend everybody to watch the Quiet on Set documentary, tough as it is, as triggering as it may be. I think it's important that people are aware of it. And there's got to be more of it. I think another episode is coming out, like, next week. So I'd recommend that. Nobody is above the law, most definitely. That's the thing, too. Like, celebrities, politicians, all these rich people who just do whatever they want with impunity, I think that's, I think that's going out of style. It's going away, hopefully. We'll see. Before we get out of here, let's talk about some good things, too. <laughs> let's let's end on a positive note, since we've just had to deal with such nonsense on that. But I do appreciate the question, and like I said, I do think it's important that we talk about it. Um, so, good things of the week. How's everybody's week going? Um, I'm trying to think of good things for the week for me. Oh, it's Easter, which is nice. I have Sunday off, because my boss is awesome. So that'll be really nice because my wife and I will get to go spend some time with her family and maybe I'll get to see my mom or something and just kind of have a relaxing, chill day. Whatever, what it's, what it's got. It's your wife's birthday on Sunday. Whoa. Well, happy birthday. D&D &D tomorrow. Reconnected with an old friend last week. That's great. Finished a big part of a writing project a few days ago, finally. Good for you. Writing's, oh, man. Yuck. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I've been working on my um I've been working on a chapter. What that you know. Well, ultimately I'd like to develop it into a book and then develop that into a trilogy, but we'll just start with the chapter first. And um that's been fun, just kind of like restructuring my book. What I'd like to do at some point maybe, and maybe I can do this through the Discord, is if I could get some feedback on it once I've finished it. That would be really cool. Cooking a goose. Wow. My daughter had school, and I didn't have work. A beautiful unicorn of a day. That is great. Um, sorry to hear about that, Amanda. I know that you've been going through that with the loss of your grandmother, and that's really terrible. 
there's there's never really anything that can be said with that kind of stuff. It's just uh, you just got to kind of take time to grieve and take your time to heal. And, you know, it's not a thing. You know, these people we lose are not things that we ever get over as much as we just kind of grow around the pain. So start with a prologue. A friend gave me the Complete Courage, the Cowardly Dog series for your birthday. That's cool. Last week, your girlfriend got approved for in-house services. Today, I got paired with her as a caregiver. In the last five months, a back pay got approved. That's awesome. That's Forever DM got two of my players to DM and me to play. <laughs> That's really great. I didn't even realize it was Easter. Yeah, I know. It kind of snuck up on me, too. Like, the other day, my wife was like, hey, we're going to my mom's on Easter. And I was like, what, e Easter? What do you mean? But I guess we're already here. She whiz, that puts us through the first quarter. I mean, this is the end of the first quarter of the year. Positive notes, still do archaeology work. Yeah, that is a really cool thing. And also, Pirate, it was dope to get to see, to talk with you briefly when you did, like, the unboxing and stuff about your job, because that's really cool. You should talk about that more. Maybe you should start a series where you do, like, uh, archaeology meets, like, DM stuff, or D&D stuff. Ooh, maybe we should do an archaeology edition. You want to help us with that? That'd be fun. Thank you very much, Purple Mur, for the gifted memberships to people. That's wonderful. Hope you guys enjoy those. Remember, with the memberships, you get access to, like, cool little emoticons that you can use and all that good stuff. My wife loves me. That's good. Yeah, it's good enough for me. The year's been going by too fast. I thought that only happened when we were having fun. Yeah, no? Nope, nope. Tid be, tid, tidbo Amitav, right? Is that what they say in Skyrim? Time marches on. So, all right. Well, we're going to get out of here, team. Before we do, just another reminder, as we tend to do, the email, bardadvice at gmail.com. Please send all questions, complaints, criticisms, critiques, bardadvice at gmail.com. It also looks like bardadvice. If you want to get some merchandise, you can do so over at manshorts.com or, more notably, over at krakendice.com. You can get yourself the Man Shorts Part 2 set or the Sarah set. And if you'd like to contribute to anything that I'm doing musically, you can do so directly via PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo, all of which are Yazik, Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. The audio for this podcast will be made available tomorrow at 12 p.m. noon Eastern Standard Time. We will be back next week, same Bard time, same Bard channel, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard on the Man Shorts YouTube channel. Please join us on the Discord. As Chris says there, he's placed another link in the uh, in the chat. So if you're not on the Discord, hop in there. Usually, the, the it's a really cool community, even though I'm not in there as much as I probably should be. I highly recommend anybody join. So thank you all for coming and hanging out again and doing this thing that we call Bard Advice with us again. I hope that everybody has a fantastic weekend and an even better week, and we will see you next time.